Good morning, everyone. I'm Tony Fulmer, and I hope that you're here for Prepping the Spring Garden. Um, for those of you that have worked with me in the past, uh, hopefully I've helped you, or if we have attended classes in our education center before, um, you know me. I've been here for 33 years now, so I'm getting to be like a piece of furniture. Um, so today what we're going to talk about is prepping the spring garden, and I am going to admit right now that I have been gone for the last month, and so this is a presentation that I've done before, and it's really designed to be given a little bit earlier than this. So when I flew back in last Friday, I was a little surprised to see that we're halfway into spring. So I'm really glad to see some of these temperatures dropping back to normal and slowing things down. And uh, so when you read the handout, the handout hasn't been updated to reflect the temperatures that we in the stage of things that we have now. So forgive me, I'll try and correct that um, as we go forward. So one of the things that I'm going to preface this right now is that um, about seven out of 10 questions, plant questions that we're getting right now incoming on Chalet um, are about the lesser celandine. So rather than make this completely about that, for those, the little yellow flower that's blooming in people's gardens. So for those of you that are interested, we'll hold that until the end. It is not included in the lawn or garden section. So we will talk about ways to attack that and control that. So let's get started talking about lawns. Hopefully you saw that you have an option to um, print the handout or have the handout available to you. So I hope you have that in hand so you don't have to take notes and you can concentrate. And please, by all means, I will try and take questions at the end and answer those as best I can. And I did just see a question come through of someone asking where the handout is. That would that comes um, about so anywhere from 24 to 12 hours before the webinar. We send out a reminder email with the Zoom link and handouts and um, online collection. So if you just check your email, you'll see that there if you registered. And now we can get started. Okay. I'm so fortunate to have Carly here as my technician because I am a dinosaur. So. Oh, Carly. There we go. Okay, so let's start with lawns. Um, many of you, uh, it's interesting. We are so far ahead for the year that um, grasses are, lawns are ahead of schedule and many of you may have already mowed once. So if there is any salt damage along parkways um, from salt, from spray of traffic, um, the thing to do is to think about applying gypsum now. So, and especially because it's very dry. So there are a couple of things you can do. If it's minimal and you don't see a lot of damage, but you think that maybe there's some salt residue there, what you can do is go out and water heavily to try and leach those that sodium through. Um, if you are actually seeing browning along there that you know is related to um, salt spray, you can apply gypsum to the soil. It would have been better to apply it preventatively last fall, but you can do it right now. And what happens is uh, the calcium in the gypsum binds with the sodium and puts it in a form that allows it to be leached through. So either by watering or by rain. Uh, again, because we are so far into spring already, this business of raking and removing leaves and winter litter, hopefully you've already done that. Um, for those of you that had leaf drop after um, you had put the more away or after you'd finished raking last year, what you may find is in areas where the leaves kind of clotted and matted and froze in, when it got warm and they you remove them, you may have bare spots. So we all probably need to think about looking at areas for seeding. So you can either, people either have seeding of bare areas or what we call overseeding. And overseeding is simply um, where you have a lawn that's a little bit thin and you would like to boost that and you broadcast seed over the entire yard. So the most important things to me are that, uh, let's talk about if you are um, doing this, if you're doing some overseeding, or if you're going in and trying to bolster one area long where perhaps it's a little bit thinner. Uh, 
Um, get the rake out and very, very lightly rake in an east-west direction and then go in the opposite direction because you want to try and get uh, as good a seed bed as you possibly can. In a perfect world, you would this, when the seed is dropped, you would actually have it in contact with the soil so that it can root down in there deeply. So anything that you can do to get thatch or any kind of accumulation of organic matter out of there uh, to expose the soil, that's better. Um, in areas where you have completely bare spots, then by all means, what you'd want to be doing if you can is to um, maybe take a spade or a shovel and you don't necessarily have to dig it up if you don't have the energy to do that, but take your spade or shovel and just go through and go in one direction and then go in an opposite direction and cross hatch. What you want is furrows and cracks and crevices for that seed to drop into and come in firm contact with the soil. So it's important that once you bury, once you put the seed down, you don't want to bury it. Um, everyone, I don't know where this got started, but everyone comes in and says, oh, I need to cover it with peat moss or I need to cover it with topsoil. That little tiny seed has a really, really, really minimal amount of stored food in there. And so if you bury it and it roots and starts trying to germinate, if it doesn't get to the soil surface before it exhausts those stored foods, you'll think that it didn't germinate at all when in fact it did. So what you can do is in those bare areas, put the seed down. And then if you want, if you insist on covering it, just put the lightest dusting. I mean, no more than a, an inch or a quarter of an inch of either topsoil or some kind of organic matter like leaf mulch or cotton burr compost, but just the tiniest, tiniest little dusting. Um, very, very, very crucial is you always want to use a starter fertilizer. Starter fertilizers, when you um, look at the products that we carry, um, we have a Scott's product. When you look at the handout there, I put them both there for you. We have a Scott's product, which the analysis is a 24, 25, 4, and then the Spoma lawn starter, which is an earth friendly organic, and that's 633. What you're seeing in those middle numbers, that's phosphorus. And typically, established lawns do not need a lot of phosphorus because it's primarily for root development and there's adequate phosphorus in the soil for established lawns. But if you use a starter fertilizer with your seeding, that extra phosphorus, that 25% phosphorus you see in the Scots and the 6% phosphorus that you see in the Espoma product will make a huge difference in the way that your seed germinates and starts growing. Um, there are a lot of different combinations of products. And again, I've tried to list a number of them. So the fertilizer only products there, uh, which is the first application. And I, I should say before we go any further, for those of you that are doing your own lawn care, if you're looking for a quick handy way to remember, um, Jennifer and I call it the hot holiday schedule. So if you are doing four applications of fertilizer and in combination with other products per year, uh, think about these four holidays. Um, if you consider um, our old April 15th tax day as a holiday, you probably do if you're getting money back, um, go ahead and make the first application by then. Second application should be right about six weeks later, right around Memorial Day. Third application would be in late August or early September for Labor Day. And then the last application can be down by Halloween. If you follow those four holidays um, using a good um, organic product or synthetic product containing nitrogen, um, that will make a tremendous difference, those four applications, in the way your lawn starts looking. Um, right now, People are concerned about putting down a combination product of a fertilizer with a crabgrass preventer. And again, I have uh, made two different um, 
delineations there. So a couple of the products that we have for established lawns are the Bonai Crabgrass Preventer and that 2408, that's the fertilizer portion, but it has a crabgrass preventer. And then we have a new product, which is pretty exciting because in the past, you've had to put combinations of things together to get fertilizer, to get crabgrass preventer, uh, to do dandelion weed control, and now bioadvanced which was formerly the Bayer Company, like Bayer Aspirin, B-A-Y-E-R, is now called BioAdvanced. And they have a new product called Five-in-One Weed and Feed. And so it's pretty unique in that it is a complete fertilization. It not only prevents a number of broadleaf weeds, the weeds listed on the label, but also post-emerge, meaning that after dandelions have emerged and are growing, uh, it will take care of those. It will also prevent crabgrass. And if you get it on a little bit late, it will also uh, control or kill um, newly germinated crabgrass, pardon me, crabgrass seeds. So that's a real, real um, amazing step forward. Now, crabgrass is an annual. And I always like to reiterate this, crabgrass is an annual. And people use the term generically um, when they come in in the spring and they say, oh, I've got a lot of crabgrass in the yard. If you go out in the lawn and you think what you have is crabgrass, you don't have crabgrass and you need to bring a sample in because it's something else. Crabgrass is an annual and it doesn't start germinating in the spring until we have four to five consecutive, day, consecutive days of 55 degree soil temperatures, not air temperatures, soil temperatures. So we, and by the way, we do post the soil temperatures on the homepage of our website um, until about the middle of May. So people have an idea in case you don't own your own soil thermometer. And most of us do not own our own soil thermometer, um, including me. So that's why we take the soil temperatures here in Wilmette for you and we post them weekly on the uh, on the homepage. So the other way to know is if you don't want to look on the webpage is to uh, crab uh, forsythia. Forsythia, when forsythia is blooming, that's a good indicator that we have started accumulating the four to five consecutive days of 55 degrees soil temperatures, which would allow crabgrass to germinate. Now, with it getting cool like this, that will slow that down. So certainly you have time to get the fertilizer plus crabgrass preventer products down um, right now. Bed prep for annuals, vegetables, and um, other annual things. Uh, more than anything, it's a matter of most of us, unless you live along the Sand Ridge in Evanston, most of us have um, a thin layer, anywhere from one to three, one to four inches of loam or topsoil over really hard compacted clay. So a really good thing to do on an annual basis, either spring or fall, is to apply organic matter um, over the surface and then either lightly till that in or you can spade it in, um, in beds where you have annual crops. And so organic matter could be in the form of your own compost if you are organic and have your own compost pile, chalet leaf mulch, chalet organic compost, cotton burr compost, uh, manure are all good ways to add incorporate to incorporate organic matter into your soil uh, and improve the tilt of your soil. This is also the time to add an organic fertilizer. And I know the question is going to arise, um, should we do that now? Can we do it later? Um, with these organic earth-friendly products like Dr. Earth, the Dr. Earth line or the Bonide line, um, the release of the nutrients is based on soil temperature and the accompanying um, uh, microbial activity in the soil to break that down and make those nutrients available. So you could put that down right now, or you can incorporate it in May if you're just doing frost hardy things like tomato or frost tender things like tomatoes and peppers you can go ahead and put those right in the area or actually even in the planting hole um, because there's virtually no possibility of burning with those. 
just as a uh, little key there, um, a lot of people are interested in knowing what annuals and vegetables uh, we have in. We're more apt to have this list of annuals, the pansies, violas, snaps, etc. cetera. Um, we're more apt to have a complete selection of those in than the veggies, because we do have fewer people doing um, early vegetables. But for those of you that are veggie um, gardeners, here is the list of things that can go in and if either as plants or as seeds, and if they have germinated, um, a frost uh, will not affect those in any negative way. Perennials. Um, certainly this year with winter leaving us early, even though it was um, a bitter winter, um, it has warmed up considerably. And so, as I said, when I came back from vacation last week, I was stunned to see how far along things are and I missed a lot of my spring bulbs. So certainly if you have grasses or any perennials that you left up last winter for winter interest, you need to be getting out there jiffy quick and getting those cut back. And you may be paying a bit of a penalty because we've had enough warm weather that virtually everything should be coming up. And especially those grasses can be pretty tedious. So, um, you really don't want to be cutting those back hard if you see new green growth emerging up among the old brown stems. Um, so ordinarily when you cut them back, like I cut mine back in March, where there was still no sign of growth and I cut them really close. I really don't like to see a lot of that old debris from the year before. But for those of you that left them up and you see those new green shoots coming up in among last year's uh, stems, you want to be sure and cut a little bit higher and not really scalp that new green growth right back to the um, to the base of the plant. There are a number of evergreen perennials, uh, and those are listed here in your handout that can be neatened up and tidied up based on what looks bad. So certainly the hellebores are up and blooming. And so you would clearly, by looking at those, you would clearly know which ones, which leaves need to be removed as the new growth comes up through that. Um, so hellebores, uh, the Virginias, uh, hookeras, uh, we call that um, dead leafing. And so you're just taking off the old leaves without affecting the new growth that's already pushing through and uh, is visible. There are a few perennials, the most common ones that should not be touched at all that are evergreen are creeping phlox, the oriental poppy and Iberus or Iberus or candy tuft. Um, those are already pushing out and um, are getting ready to bloom. And so you don't want to do any cutting for those because you will either kill the plants outright or you will certainly lose a full season of bloom with that. So you don't want to do that. Um, this is something that seems kind of um, just good sense, but if you have things that you know, uh, perennials like peonies, um, anything that gets big and you end up um, either staking it or putting a hoop around it or a cage, um, get those up uh, out of the garage if you left them, uh, if you put them in for storage, get those in the ground right now as soon as you can and let the plants grow through them naturally. Um, if you're putting individual stakes in for things like delphiniums, um, go ahead and get those in the ground now, uh, but make sure that you're not piercing the root system of those. And you really, if you haven't checked out um, the selections for staking now, there are so many cool options. So it's not just a peony ring or a peony cage or hoop anymore. There are all kinds of connecting systems that you can use to encircle things that kind of do what I call slopping and flopping. And you can connect them and you won't see anything. But it's much easier if you do that now than if you do it later when the plant has achieved its full mature size. And even though we're talking about perennials, that certainly um, includes things that maybe are not always self-supporting, like Annabelle hydrangea, the one that has the big softball-like flowers. Um, if you're going to do some kind of a cage or something to help Annabelle, um, that should go on now so that the plant can grow up through that. And just like annuals and perennials, 
it's undoubtedly best if you go ahead and apply uh, your fertilizers now. And people are always asking, what, what should I use? Um, look at your um, hand out there. And those, if you'll notice, the products that I recommend, the Bud and Bloom Booster, the Rosen Flower, the Bulb Food, the Espoma Flower Tone, they all have higher phosphorus. So unlike turf or, or lawns, where you establish turf, you don't really need the phosphorus. You only need the phosphorus if you're doing new seeding or sodding. With blooming things, roses, perennials, flowering shrubs, they really respond to that higher phosphorus. So if you look at the ratios there, the products that I've recommended, you always have the first number is nitrogen, and that's leaf growth and leaf color. The second number is phosphorus, which promotes rooting and flowering and fruiting. If you notice all these products with the exception of the espoma, which is a little bit light on phosphorus, you have a ratio of at least two, two and a half or three times as much phosphorus as nitrogen. And so when you lose, use products like that, if those plants are getting enough sun to utilize those phosphorus, you really, really, really see a big difference in the way your plants bloom, especially things that have recurrent bloom like roses that flower you deadhead them, they flower again. You deadhead them, they flower again throughout the summer and into the fall. They're really heavy feeders and are really responsive to that phosphorus. And it's really important to mulch. Um, we all know the, the reasons that we mulch, but the, one of the things that I would say is um, on perennials, I really like to use um, leaf mulch or cotton burr compost or your own compost, um, something that is what I would call a soft mulch as opposed to a bark mulch. Um, because if you happen to get it up against the stems of perennials, soft stem things like perennials, you're less likely to do um, damage to them. Um, generally speaking, when we put mulches down, we want to leave a one to two inch opening uh, ring around there so that the mulch doesn't rest right up against the stems. Because perennials and even annuals have soft stems like that, if you put something up against them and then it starts raining and those stems don't have a chance to dry out, you can start having problems with stem rot organisms uh, or with other fungal organisms disease. So always leave that one or two inch band open, whether it's a perennial, an annual, and that even goes for trees and shrubs, whether you're using a soft mulch like leaf mulch or cotton burr compost or a woody mulch uh, like chunk bark or shredded bark. Perennials, if you've had, um, I'm not a big one for using insecticides and fungicides if you don't have to. So if you have had things in the past that have historically had fungal issues like many of the garden flocks, um, and we're starting to see a lot more powdery mildew on peonies, if either of those are problematic or offensive to you, even though they tend to be more cosmetic than really damaging to the plant, this would be the time to apply fungicides. You always apply fungicides preventatively, not curatively. So this is the time to do this well in advance of when the, um, uh, when the issue starts to show. And uh, one of my favorites is um, Immunox and that is systemic and with each application that lasts for up to two weeks. So you might wanna check that out. Certainly um, in our area where we have so much shade cover and we have so many slug susceptible plants like hostas, um, you want to be ahead of the game on that, but not too far ahead of the game. So um, if you've had a problem in the past, uh, if you have sl slug susceptible hostas and I, um, will say that there is a correlation that the thicker the leaf of a hosta, the more corrugated or crinkled it is, uh, the less likely you are to have slug problems. So if you've had slug problems in the past, I would make a point of making sure that you do not use a mulch right up to the stems of the plant. 
um, I would say leave a, a bare soil area all the way out to the mature drip line. So if you have <clears throat> something like Halcyon, which can be 24 inches wide, when you're doing your spring cleanup and you're putting your mulch down and you've had a slug issue, um, or if you have an irrigation system that you use frequently to keep the soil damp, then leave at least that mature spread open and don't put the mulch right up to the uh, stems where they're, they're going to be buried in that. You have plenty of time on that because slugs do not emerge from winter hibernation until temperatures are 70, air temperatures, not soil temperatures, are 70 degrees or higher. Uh, the product that we use is Sluggo and that is iron phosphate and so that is a stomach poison. And so the bait they are that Sluggo is adhered to, they um, eat that, ingest that, and it gives them an upset tummy. And it takes about three or four days and it will kill them. Um, you won't find, it's not like the elephant graveyard. Uh, you won't find a pile of them somewhere, but they will have been dis dispersed and they will be long gone. Um, this is also the time to address weeds in the garden, and we're talking about pre-emergence, uh, things that are applied before the weeds germinate. So um, number one choice with that, of course, is a product called Preen, and it lasts for up to three months. The important things on any pre-emergent product to be successful and have uh, best control with that are to make sure it will not kill, it's not a post-emerge, so it will not kill weeds that are already there. So if you're protecting a garden full of perennials or if you're putting this in shrub borders um, and you're using preen, you need to make sure that all of those broadleaf weed seedlings are pulled up and out of there. And any spring cleanup that you're going to do should also be done in advance because the effectiveness is directly related to how uniform the barrier of the herbicide is. So what you don't want to do is do some light cleanup, put the preen down, and then go in and decide, oh, there are a lot of leaves in there or whatever, and then rake because that's resting on the surface and that will disturb the uniformity of the herbicide barrier. And wherever you have that disturbance, the weeds will pop up through that. So um, preen is really our recommendation and our go-to product. Um, I know people are going to ask about corn gluten. Um, corn gluten is indeed an organic, quote, weed control. It's a, it's, and it's sold as a pre-emergent before the weeds actually start showing but it doesn't really work that way. What happens is um, it allows the weeds to develop, to germinate, but if it, if it is used properly under the right conditions, it inhibits the formation of that root system and the little weed seedlings just keel over and germinate. So that needs to be used like the preen when you have all of the existing weeds taken out, but it's a little bit trickier because you want to apply it to slightly moist soils, um, but then you don't want, if the weeds are germinating, you actually want that to be dry for a few days afterwards, because if they, if that, that root, that primordial root starts to develop and we get some good rains, a lot of times the weeds will recover. So um, if you're hearing that corn gluten maybe is not my preferred choice or the most effective choice, um, for weed control, pre-emergent weed control, that would be correct. Um, if you've had deer or rabbit issues, and I don't know anyone who hasn't had, especially rabbits this year, the rabbit issues over the winter have been devastating. Uh, certainly in my own garden, they've attacked plants. There was just so much snow cover, there wasn't anything for them to feed on. So they turned to their usual things, which are things like burning bush, um, uh, hornbeam, uh, fruit trees, crab apples, anything that has thin sweet bark, they really went after those. And if they remove a patch of bark or a ring of bark all the way around the stem, girdling that, then everything above that will be dead and will have to be removed. So um, as new plants come up, 
um, especially things like hostas, roses, and daylilies. Those three things in my personal garden are the things that both rabbit and deer have gone after. So um, I have both products listed, the plant skied or the repels all, which are really, really, really effective if you get them on early enough in time. The thing that you have to remember is early in the season when these hostas and roses and daylilies are progressing almost daily and getting larger, earlier in the season like this, you have to reapply so that there is a coating on there and the deer and rabbits learn that there is, uh, that this is unpalatable and uh, not very tasty. Um, if you have rabbit issues and you have the one, the really, really, really best thing, um, there is a liquid fence product called dual action rabbit repellent. And unfortunately we did not get that on. When you look at the products, you can shop these products online at the end of the class. We have the standard liquid fence rabbit preventer. What you want to do is get the one that's called dual purpose dual action, and that has a blue band on it as opposed to the green band. Um, and it's highly, highly effective. It has a, a, the addition of cinnamon oil, which evidently young rabbits and all rabbits find extremely distasteful. So if you're looking to try a new repellent um, and you've had problems with effectiveness in the past, be sure and try that liquid fence dual action um, rose repellent. Speaking of roses, um, this is one of the things where the handout is kind of um, outdated this spring because they are so far along that any kind of mulching or mounding or winter protection should already be moved. And um, so you really now should have the pruning done. Um, I've got, I'm sure you do as well. You have leaves that are not just buds, you have fully developed leaves. And so you want to get in and do whatever pruning um, that you're going to do. And the thing to remember is whenever you decide what the height is, um, but you need to do a little bit of pruning beyond where the dead is to shape it up a little bit, always try and make your cut on each stem. Make sure that you prune immediately above a, either a leaf bud, a little pink leaf bud, or a set of leaves that are facing outward rather than inward. If you do that, if you make that your pruning cut on each stem, what will happen is the rose will, uh, the stem that is, follows that will be growing out from the center of the plant. And so that will improve air circulation and reduce the likelihood of diseases like black spot, for example. Um, again, this is a little bit outdated. The roses are so far along that hopefully if you've done your cleanup, um, any leaf debris would be removed. In the future, know that that's really important because our primary disease here is leaf spot. And so that winters over not only, it doesn't winter over in the soil per se, but it winters over on leaves and it winters over in stem tissue. And so that's another reason um, to consider doing a harder cut back on your roses. I'm sure there are people that looked at their roses this year and because of the snow cover, you may have, and I'm not talking about climbers, climbers are a different story, but you may have hybrid tea roses and floribunda roses and shrub roses that are two or three feet tall and have leaves that are all the way out to the ends like that. Um, and you're tempted to leave that. So what you will get from that is that you will have earlier bloom and you will have a taller, larger plant by the end of the season. But what I find is even in that case where you have you know, growth all the way out 18, 20, 24 inches, I like to cut back harder because the harder you cut them back, and again, I underline, we're not talking about climbing roses, um, but if you're talking about hybrid teas and floribundas and grandifloras and a lot of the new shrub roses, the harder you cut them back, the closer you cut them back to the ground, the more new shoots you'll have arising from the base of the plant and the fuller, denser plant you'll have that will have more growing points to have flowers. Um, now is the time if you want to do a systemic um, insecticide and disease control, um, you can go ahead and do that. And I have made a recommendation there. The bio-advanced all-in-one rose and flower care um, is something that you, it's a nine 
14, 9, which again um, reiterates the theme that you always want the phosphorus, the second number, to be one and a half to two times greater than the first number on anything blooming. And so if you use that, that not only fertilizes, but is a systemic insecticide and a systemic fungicide. And you apply that about every six weeks, or I would do it about every five to six weeks. And then of course, just like perennial beds, you the roses are really going to perform better and they're going to uh, bloom for you better. And you're not going to have to water as often if you apply one to two inches of the chalet leaf mulch, cotton burr compost or shredded pine. Um, you can, of course, because this is a woody stem plant, you can go ahead and use a chunk bark or a shredded bark if you do not want to um, replace it as often. That's the only downside to these softer mulches uh, as they're melting down, improving the microbial activity in the soil and um, improving the um, structure of it they do have to be replaced or topped off a little bit more frequently than the wood bark mulches. Spring flowering bulbs, well, this is, this is not very timely, is it? Um, windblown debris, you've probably already done your spring cleanup because, uh, I, again, I came home to daffodils. The early daffodils were already finished, so that needs to be done. The important thing to remember is um, these bulbs are heavy feeders you have three opportunities to fertilize. So if these are new bulbs, it's, it behooves you to fertilize at the time of planting, which is September and October. Um, if these are going to be long-term plantings of daffodils or hyacinths, or even some of the Darwin tulips or the perennialize, uh, you can fertilize when you put them, uh, when they start emerging in the ground. And the bulb tone is a terrific one to use. That's a 353. Um, that is a, an Espoma product. Or again, um, I like the um, Dr. Earth, Bud and Bloom, or the bulb food is really good because that's high in phosphorus. And if the, you know, the bulbs got ahead of you and you didn't have an opportunity to fertilize them then, you can fertilize them now or immediately after they flower because there will be a four to six weeks period with some of the daffodils, it's up to two month period where that foliage is still green and the bulb is building up nutrients and it's storing food um, so that you have great bloom next year. So don't dismay, uh, don't be alarmed if you haven't fertilized yet you can go ahead and use that right now, or you can wait until after they bloom and apply that to the soil surface because they'll be utilizing those nutrients uh, in the post bloom time. Probably you're far enough along that the uh, repellents are a non-issue. Um, the tulips are usually the thing that's the biggest concern. Um, deer and rabbits both like them early on, and um, rabbits and deer may affect tulips later. Um, daffodils and hyacinths both contain toxins that, and that's why you find them left alone. That's not a problem. But tulips and crocus are the two things. And of course, the crocus should already be finished. So again, this year, that's kind of a non-issue. But just watch if you have late tulips and those are budding and blooming, uh, you may want to use either the uh, Repelzol spray or the uh, plant skied just to make sure that they those uh, buds, that you get to enjoy them rather than having the animals enjoying them. Ground cover, um, if you covered with evergreen boughs, and so that, that's, a little, that's a, a little bit of a typo where it says remove evergreen ground covers, that doesn't mean cut them back, the Binca and the Pakistander, the Euonymus. You can do a light cut back if you want, uh, but that's for if you had any kind of, in the fall or in the winterizing lecture, I very often recommend covering, especially English ivy with, um, cut evergreen boughs to protect them from dehydration. So that's what that re references. Remove any kind of evergreen cover uh, or boughs that you have placed over, obviously, because your ground cover now is in um, full growth mode. Um, we had so much snow cover. I seriously doubt if many of you have any damage to your English ivy, uh, but if you do, then you may wanna go ahead and uh, cut that out as the new growth starts to emerge. 
and just remove that. And just that thinning out will help improve the air circulation. Um, because if we have a wet spring, you can have problems with English ivy having leaf spot. You can have problems with Pachysandra getting uh, Volutella stem blight. So anything that you do to increase the air circulation, and that includes the accumulated leaves that have blown in and stuck, uh, anything that you can do to remove that and increase the air circulation through there, that will dramatically um, reduce future disease problems. And right now, one of the things that we're seeing is it's really dry. And so this dryness with this cool weather um, is allowing, is going to slow down the spread of any fungal diseases. Um, check the Euonymus coloratus, the purple leaf winter creeper. Check that for little white dots up and down the stem. Um, those are the females and that would be indicative of a scale infestation. So you need to come in and check with us for how to control that. And then Pachysandra, um, gets a stem blight. And I've had a few calls about that early this year because the ground was still moist and warm when the first snow hit, and then it was covered with snow all winter. So um, that really created a greenhouse effect, which is problematic. And on really heavy, dense beds, established beds of Pachysandra um, that have a lot of leaf litter in there or debris stuck in there, and they're just not drying out, um, you can see Pachysandra stem blight. And that manifests itself as um, usually kind of erratic, oranging or browning of stems, of leaves, and the leaves curl. And it doesn't take out the whole bed, but it can be very um, erratic and unpredictable. And if you check those orangey brown leaves, if you take a plant and look at the stem of it, um, that will usually travel down at least part of the stem and maybe all the way down to the ground. So if anybody has issues with that, we can uh, address Pachysandra stem blight uh, at the end of the uh, class when we're taking questions. Trees and shrubs. Um, if you had stems wrapped, if you had those plastic cylinders, corrugated plastic cylinders around the stems of trees for protection, uh, like your crab apples or horn beams, um, or if you had burlap screens up protecting rhododendrons, uh, azaleas, hollies, boxwood, those can certainly come down now. Uh, gosh, I hope that we're past the uh, winter and that we don't even use the word SNOW. Um, I'm always entertained when people say that they have had a broken branch or a dead branch um, on a plant, and when can they prune it? Um, anytime a branch is dead, anytime a branch is broken, that's the time to go ahead and prune it. Now, if you have a choice between a wet day or a dry day, I always prefer doing this kind of removal um, on days when it's dry because there are some diseases that are believed to be transmitted in drops of water. So you could theoretically, you could move that from branches and stems um, to reinfect. So wait until uh, a dry day if you can. Again, many of you, because things are so advanced, many of you have already done your pruning of um, shrubs hydrangeas in particular. So, but if you haven't, you're still kind of on the cusp. So if something blooms before July 1, you shouldn't be touching it because that's a spring bloomer. So things like the forsythia and a number of the viburnum that are budded and showing bloom, um, future bloom, you don't wanna be doing pruning on that. You prune those within four to six weeks after they finish blooming because then the growth that they will make all summer will be the um, basis for next year's potential bloom. If it's a summer bloomer, like many of the spireas, um, if it blooms after July 1st, and that would also include the cone-shaped hydrangeas, what we call the panicle hydrangeas, like little lime, um, 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 blanking out, oh, strawberry sundae, any of those cone shaped types, those are blooming after July. So you can go ahead and do the removal of last year's dead seed heads that you may have left up all winter for uh, ornamentation. And if you want to do a little bit of pruning on those, you can prune those down a little bit farther than the um, dead flowers. 
For trees and shrubs, if you have something, um, know their susceptibilities. Nature in her infinite wisdom has given virtually all plants um, one or more bugaboos, whether that's an insect or whether it's a disease. So know ahead of time because overwhelmingly, as I mentioned with roses and perennials, um, control of fungal organisms in particular is its prevention it's not cure. So you can do a lot of good now by finding out whether your plant has a problem or if you know that it's had a problem from past history, you should see us about the application of appropriate products in advance of the disease. You'll be preventing, not curing. This is a great time too while you're doing uh, spring cleanup. If you have acid loving plants, and first and foremost, that would include blueberries who are very, very intolerant of our alkaline soils. So anything our so look at blueberries, rhododendrons, azaleas, hollies, um, boxwood to a lesser extent. While they're acid loving, they are much more tolerant than the four or five plants that I just mentioned. And so garden sulfur is slow acting, but it is the um, long-term solution. And we recommend on rhododendrons, azaleas, boxwood, that sort of thing, um, and especially blueberries, incorporating that in the hole at planting time, but then thereafter multiple applications applied topically to the surface of the soil. And without a soil test, a general recommendation on an established rhododendron, um, I give mine one, like a three foot plant that's three feet tall and three feet wide. I use one really heaping cup uh, per plant, but that must be applied to bare soil. So if you already put your, so in a perfect world, what you would do is you would do your spring cleanup, but before you add your new mulch, you would go ahead and put the sulfur down and distribute that one cup or cup and a half if it's a larger plant or two cups if it's a really large plant. Anytime you apply sulfur to an acid loving plant's soil, you do have to apply it directly to the soil. So any mulch residue needs to be pulled out at least to the drip line, that outer, you know, that imaginary line down from the outer edge of the branches. All of that should be completely bare soil. Then you apply the sulfur. Then I like to water lightly to put it in contact with the soil and then push uh, or apply fresh mulch over the top of that. So, so that's in contact with soil. On something like blueberries, if you're not doing them in pots, if you're doing them in the ground, you probably need to think about doing at least um, three applications, topical applications of sulfur to the soil. So yes, every time you do that, you need to pull the mulch away, make sure that the sulfur is in contact with the soil, water it lightly, and then put the mulch back. Um, fertilizers, if you check the uh, handout, we have, uh, I have a number of recommendations there um, to put down and then freshen the mulch. Um, there's always a question, is spring or fall better? And believe me, I've read a lot of articles and um, even on the very scholarly ones, there is, um, it's probably evenly divided 50-50 between spring and fall. So if you didn't do it last fall, you can certainly do it right now so that those nutrients are available to plant as it starts pushing out new growth. We've already talked about preen before. So if you have shrub borders um, that are just shrub borders, whether they have perennials in them or don't, again, the preen must be used uh, and applied to a weed-free surface. Now that raises the question about, oh, I've already had my spring cleanup, my mulch is down, do I put the preen or the weed preventer on top or should it go underneath? And this is one of those things where if you read the preen label, they actually like it on top of the mulch. So what that's saying is that allows the, the weed the opportunity to germinate and come up, try and push through the mulch and then encounter the pre-emergent. Um, 
I've done it both ways and I really haven't seen a lot of difference. So in the past, I have put the weed preventer down and then put the mulch over the top of that. The one uh, downside to that is that it's conceivable um, if you have put the mulch, the pre-emergent weed control down first, and then you're applying the mulch over the top of that, what can happen is if you're using a rake uh, and you're moving the mulch back and forth, you can kind of affect the uniformity of the distribution of the weed control, and then you can leave little open spots. And as I mentioned earlier, the um, effectiveness of any kind of pre-emergent weed control is directly correlated with how consistent and how uniform and that there's a no holds holes, H-O-L-E-S situation. Because if you ho have holes um, in the weed control that are larger than a silver dollar, whatever, those are potential hot spots where you can get weeds later on. Um, I think we've talked a little bit about it. Um, after winter debris is done, uh, been cleared away, after you have done your spring cleanup, uh, make sure that you top off your mulch and so again, whether it is a, what I call a soft mulch, like cotton burr compost, chalet leaf mulch, or whether you prefer a um, wood bark product like a chunk bark or shredded hardwood, apply a two inch layer and make sure that you leave a donut sized opening around the trunks of trees that have an individual trunk coming out of the ground or on multi-stem trees or multi-stem shrubs. Make sure that you leave a two to three inch uh, donut shaped opening around the perimeter so that again, you don't have the mulch resting right up against the, uh, the trunks of the plants. Um, I think that pretty much covers everything. And now um, let's see what I haven't covered or what questions that I have stirred up. So Carly's going to step in here and help me see if we have any. Oh, okay. So I didn't see the handout. Where can I find this? Um, I can send it out again to everyone. It, it usually goes out um, anywhere from 24 to 12 hours before our classes. Um, and it's the same email that you registered with, but um, I think I can just send it out again just to make sure everyone got it. Right now, that's okay. So we have 11 Q&A. Mm -hmm. Okay. So right now it's all about the handout. Okay, we will definitely resend the handout. Okay, so we have a question about herbs here. When will it be, when will I lost that? When will it be safe? Okay, when will it be safe enough to bring herbs out gradually? Um, Tanya, I'm not sure if you're talking about established herb plants that you have had in the garden in your home all winter, or if you are um, doing seeds and you're going to bring the seeds out. There's a whole, if, if these are established plants, um, I think the most important thing, basil is the number one herb in America, no question. And you have to remember um, it is, it's tropical, it likes it hot, it likes it humid. And so what you don't want to do is be looking for, to put basil out now. Uh, typically basil, so if you have hardy uh, herbs that were perennial in the garden, they can be outside gradually starting right now with 50 to 60 degree temperatures, you may just wanna watch those night temperatures. But for, since basil is such an important uh, herb, that's the one that you don't wanna be tempted to put out until probably Mother's Day. And so people start asking us the end of March or end of April in the first week in, in May. And you're not, it's a little bit like tomato plants. You're not gaining anything by putting basil out early. If it is, the nights are cool, even if it doesn't get frosted, if the soil is wet and cold, that basil is going to sit there and sulk and it may even just yellow up and die. So Shelly has a question about peonies. 
Peonies typically shelly once they've been in for a year or two and they have reestablished, um, they are going to need a support. Even if they're out in good sun and it's a strong variety that has strong stems, it's probably always best to have them because when they have the weight of those flowers on there, um, they can do what I call flopping and slopping. So a support, a peony ring, a hoop, a cage is generally uh, a good idea with them. Okay. Okay, uh, Erica, if I cut back an emerging peony stem now, would that prune? No, oh, that's a great question. If I cut back an emerging peony stem now, would that pruning produce more stems? If so, would it sacrifice this season's blooms? Um, yes, it would. Peonies do not respond that way. Whatever comes out of the ground, whatever shoots you have, each one of those shoots, depending upon how thick it is, has the potential to uh, produce a flower. If you prune that, it's not like pruning a shrub, you will not get more stems. And if you prune it very hard, if you cut a peony back uh, before, say the middle of August, you take foliage off, you are not only, you've not only sacrificed this year's flowers, but by cutting off foliage, you have weakened it and reduced the amount of carbohydrates that it's going to have and stored food. So it is not going, it's going to be a much, much weaker plant. So um, you cut peonies back anytime um, after the middle of September or anytime in October, you do not touch them now. You will um, absolutely sacrifice the plant's blooms. What are your recommendations, this is from Catherine, what are your recommendations for spring care for native plants, including in rain gardens? Thank you. Um, in a, in, this is something that I'm having to learn. I'm very OCD about my garden. And so um, what I'm doing in areas where I have native plants um, and I don't have anything else in my woodland garden, I am allowing the um, leaves to just drop and decompose there. And uh, the same thing in my rain garden or my, what I call the Delta. Um, when I do any kind of a cutback, which would have half to this year have been done earlier because everything is in growth so early, uh, things like sedges and grasses, um, I'm just cutting those things back and chopping them up and putting them right back on the ground. So you're basically uh, reproducing the um, conditions that they would have in nature where their foliage would just in, in last year's you know, detritus from last year's stems would just be dropping down to the ground and um, decomposing and adding to the biological activity in the organic matter and soil. So um, if you don't have that, if for some reason you um, that was cleaned up and you have bare soil, then I would think in terms of adding, if you don't have your own compost, then um, lightly add um, either the Cottonburg compost or the leaf mulch. Both of those products will do a nice job for you. What is the best fertilizer for peppers and tomatoes? This is from Lorene. Um, Lorene, that's a great question. Um, I'm going to look at my handout so I get the name exactly right. Um, there's a Dr. Earth product and there's a Dr. Earth vegetable product. And there is also a, um, a Bonite product. So there is a tomato tone. And then there is also a Dr. Earth vegetable product. And those are formulated that those have a moderate amount of nitrogen and a good amount of phosphorus because with peppers and tomatoes, yes, you want a full bushy plant. So you need some nitrogen, but especially on tomatoes, if you get excessive nitrogen, um, the plants will use that to your disadvantage and they will grow and they will be leafy and the hormone balance will be such that they're not inclined to flower as much. So again, you want a moderate amount of nitrogen and a higher amount of tomatoes. So there's a Dr. Earth product and there is a, uh, a Spoma product that will do a really, really, really nice job for you. Usha asks about spreading euonymus look dead, leaves are white and dry. Um, if they looked fine going into the winter, then this may be um, a situation where we just have some cold temperature damage. But the thing that I would look for is if you were, if the plants were becoming symptomatic last year, um, I mentioned earlier the possibility of euonymus scale. 
And that is a sucking insect that is attached to the stems and the underside of the leaves. So you may wanna take a look at that. And if you have some of that, if you have you want to scale, you need to come in and we can help you with a, uh, a possible control. Um, okay, Lorene uh, also asks, um, should we put the sluggo down now as I'm seeing hosta shoots? Um, this is one of those things where we're kind of on the cusp. I guess I'd be tempted to leave it uh, just a little bit longer. Uh, as I said, we really want the, the daytime air temperatures to be consistently in the 70s. Um, even with that early weather, if those 70 degree temperatures daytime don't stay consistent, uh, the slugs may not emerge. Um, but certainly within the next week, it would probably be safe to put the sluggo down um, then. Uh, uh oh, an anonymous attendee. The, oh, the husband's in trouble. My husband mowed over my emerging peony. Will it survive until next year without fully emerging, or should I pull it and replace it? Um, if this is a peony that's been in three, four, five years or more, and it had seven, ten, or more stems, um, it will survive probably. It will just be dramatically, dramatically weakened. So you may want to fertilize it likely with anything that you would use, um, like the button bloom or the bulb booster would be fine. Um, because the downside is if you pull it and put a new peony in, a new peony will take probably two to three years to establish and get to some sizable uh, blooming state again. So I'd be more tempted if it's an old established plant, I'd be tempted to fertilize it lightly and um, see what happens with it. This is from Shane and he asked, my rhododendrons were installed last year and blooms were gorgeous. Right now, I am not seeing very many buds for this year. Does it need fertilizer? Um, Shane, the, there's, there's two parts to that question. One is, do you have large leaf types or do you have small leaf type rhododendrons? It's really crucial with the, the large leaf rhododendrons that you deadhead them or snap the old flowers off when they finish blooming. That will dramatically improve your chances of flowering the following year. On the small leaf types, it would be very tedious to do that. And even I don't do that. They tend to rebloom very, very well anyway. Um, it may just be a function of the plant is not well established and it's spending the next year and or even some of this year um, getting a root system established and so it's putting resources into roots and leaves as opposed to flowers. Um, the other function, the other thing is it can be a function of shade. And again, if you're talking about the large leaf types where the leaves are, you know, three to four inches long or longer, um, they need to have um, I would say at least three to four hours of some type of accumulated sun during the course of the day during the growing season to set flowers. Um, if you put rhododendrons, especially the large leaf types, in lots of dense, dense shade, then um, you're not going to have as many flowers. We mustn't ever confuse on any plant, we mustn't confuse shade tolerance with shade preference. Okay, Laura. I have a chokeberry shrub that isn't doing well in the current shady spot it's in. It has already begin, begun to leaf out. Is it too late to transplant in a different area of my yard? Um, chokeberries are really sturdy and really tough. And especially if that was planted within the last year or so, it probably has a fairly concentrated root system. So I would say with these cool temperatures now that we're, we're getting, this would be a great time to do it. If it's been in the ground for two or three years, make sure that you take a fairly sizable root ball, make sure the root ball is moist so that it holds together, try and take as much of the root system as you can. It's more important to have it wider than deeper. And when you're doing a transplant, I always like to have the uh, next resting place already pre-dug so to the right size so that you can gently put the plant back in so that it's not sitting on the ground, um, dehydrated, having a root system dehydrate uh, while you spend time um, digging a new hole. Uh, from Tanya, with lots of insect um, insects emerging now, what's the best product for insect control? Um, that's one 
that you're probably, that's kind of a generic question. So I would ask you to come in and see one of our staff members because are we talking about uh, insects that affect plants or are we talking about nuisance insects? So um, that one can be a little bit tricky. There, there may not be um, an organic product depending upon what you're looking for, there may not be the appropriate organic product available um, for what you're looking for. Um, Morris, I applied sedge ender to the lesser, okay, here's the lesser celandine question that I knew was coming. Um, and I mentioned that I would answer later in the, in the season, in the, in the class. I applied sedge ender to the lesser celandine. Some of you may know that as, as buttercup. Um, that's the one right now that is blooming in everyone's or many people's yards. It has the pretty little yellow flower. And then when you look at it, it has a glossy, not quite heart-shaped leaf, but it has a very glossy leaf that would make you think, oh, this is ornamental and pretty. Um, it is not ornamental, it is not pretty, it is an invasive, and it is problematic because it reproduces um, not only by little tiny bulbs uh, in, in the site where it's landed, um, but squirrels and chipmunks move them around. Um, the seeds not only blow in, but the seeds and bulbs are carried in water courses and they flow downstream and hit soil and start growing. So um, this is a real problem. Um, and primarily because of this bulb, it's not really a bulb, it's a thickened root. And so Thing number one, issue number one is it disappears. It is what we call a spring ephemeral. So it is a true wildflower like a trillium. It emerges early in the spring while we still have no shade from deciduous trees. It flowers, it disperses its seeds, the bulblets reproduce. And then a few weeks later, it kind of disappears. And everybody thinks, oh, well, that wasn't so bad. It's gone. Well, this plant reproduces in biblical proportions. So one this year can be 10 to 15 to 20 to 50 next year. So you need to be looking at a control. Morris's specific question was, I applied sedge ender to the lesser celandine in my lawn on Monday. Um, but I see no results so far. Um, you got great information because sedge ender is one of the few safe products to use out in the lawn that will do uh, justice to that. You have to remember, Morris, it has been cool. And the absorption of all of these control products is based on um, air temperature. And so when it's 50 degrees during the day, the absorption is going to be slower. So you need to be patient. Uh, it does take a while for the plants to respond. Um, what about a second application? Um, I would say in another week or so, if you don't see any um, effect yet, I would give it a second application. But in the meantime, especially for those of you that just have small numbers and are applying a control, um, I personally would take the time to go out there and pinch those flowers off and throw them away. Um, the other thing that you need to understand is this is one of those things where it takes a community to eradicate this. So yes, you may be able to eradicate it and control it on your property, but if your neighbors surrounding you um, are not in concert with you, if you haven't talked about this and how, how really devastating uh, the lesser celandine can be, um, then you're kind of, you're, you're fighting an uphill battle. So if it's coming in from your neighbors uh, and you have a relationship with them, or even if you don't have a relationship with them, maybe it's time to get one and um, tread gently, but explain that all of you need to work together to get this under control. This is a very, very, very difficult thing to control. And when it is in beds uh, with desirable ornamental plants, um, there is really only one active ingredient that you can use that will take care of that without damaging uh, your desirable shrubs or perennials, and that is anything containing glyphosate, G-L-Y-P-H-O-S-A-T-E, as the active ingredient. Um, my dahlias are sprouting in pots in the garage. Can I take them outside yet? Um, 
you can take them outside to get them to sun because if you leave them in a dark garage, they're going to stretch and elongate and be weak stem for the year and they're not going to be very good. So I would say yes, if you're going to leave them in pots for later potting out or if you're going to leave them in pots, um, you need to get them outside on sunny days and get them in as much sun as possible, but they are very frost tender. So um, you will have to give them shelter if there's any possibility of frost or temperatures, you know, well below 40. Marcia asked, when is a good time to move perennials in the garden? Plus, I, can I move sedge and split it up? Okay. Um, Marcia, that's a really difficult question. Uh, and I might have a different answer for myself and for you. Um, perennials, if you have to... In a perfect world, most perennials, and again, peonies, you never touch right now. There's an old rule that things that bloom early in the spring should be moved in the fall, and things that are summer blooming can be uh, dug up and moved right now. Um, if you absolutely have to move perennials now, then I would say take the largest, like a shrub that we were just talking about, take the largest root ball that you possibly can and get it moved as soon as possible while the plant is still small and make sure and um, uh, mulch it lightly so that it doesn't have um, soil temperature stress during the summer. Sedges are a little bit different. Sedges are like hosta. They're like a piece of furniture. You can move them whenever you think about it. So yes, a sedge, whether it's established or just planted last year, you can dig that up, uh, take a knife, saw through that and split that up right now. But again, any kind of moving you want to do as soon as possible. Um, Rhonda asked, do you recommend a cage for Annabelle hydrangeas? I typically use stakes and semicircles, but I end up needing so many for every hydrangea. I love hydrangeas, but they drive me crazy every summer. Um, Annabelle can be um, weak stemmed and floppy. Um, I personally see that when the plants, the more shade they're in, the weaker stem they're going to be and the more apt they are to flop. Um, if you push them along with too much nitrogen fertilizer, that first number, um, you're going to get an elongated plant that again is going to be um, weaker. And then the third thing, more than anything to me, is the pruning. And so I tend to see that for people that cut Annabelle's, treat them like a perennial and cut them all the way down to the ground so they're only an inch or two tall and all of your growth is green instead of woody, um, that's going to be an Annabelle that's going to be much more uh, susceptible to what I call flopping and slopping and just kind of hanging all over. So for those of you that don't, that want to reduce the likelihood of that, I think if you can, if this is an established Annabelle, if you cut them back more on the order of 30 to 36 inches and leave those woody stems, um, those are much more apt to be um, self-supporting. But just remember um, that the more shade they're in, regardless of what you do, the deeper the shade, they will tolerate that, but the stems are going to be weaker and more apt to slop around. Uh, Lori asked, do you cut down hydrangeas uh, similar to florist types in the fall or spring. Some will flower and some don't. Um, on those, what I would call the mop heads, the pink slash blue um, hydrangeas, I would wait and I would not cut those back in the fall. I would leave them. And right now you can go out there in your garden, Lori, and you can see buds and you will clearly be able to tell the difference between what's live tissue and what's dead. And obviously anything that is does not have a bud swelling or open leaves now, I would say remove that. Um, what can I add to the soil to help them flower? That's a great question because they are heavy feeders. And so when you do your spring cutting, I would like to make an application of any kind of a um, bloom promoting fertilizer like the bulb food or the, um, oh, um, I don't want to do this, uh, button bloom booster, rose and flower, or the bulb, the um, Dr. Earth bulb food. Any of those are high in phosphorus, and I would make an application now when you do the spring pruning uh, and the application of the spring mulch, and then about four to six, six weeks later, two applications on those. Okay, uh, anonymous. 
Could you repeat uh, instructions on trimming rose bushes? Which direction is facing? Okay. Um, when you're pruning roses in a perfect world, uh, when you go in at the end of each stem, you would like the cut to be made above a bud that is facing away from the center of the plant and to the outside. Because whether it's a tree, a, a, a rose, or whether it's a flowering shrub, wherever you prune, whichever direction that bud that's at the very end of the remaining shrub, whichever direction that's pointing, that's the way when that starts growing out, that's the way that stem is going to be. So you always on roses, you always want that top shrub, that top bud to be facing outward. And that way the plant will open up and start growing out this way. And it will open up the center of the plant for more, more air circulation. And you'll be less likely to have um, diseases. Tanya, um, is permethrin safe for pets and to apply to plants? Um, why don't you email me about that? I really, that's a very specific question and I want to read the label um, on that, Tanya. So um, I, will, I will take your email. Uh, Carly, would you get Tanya Haskins? Yes, I and I will, uh, I will email you later on that. Okay. Okay, Kiwi writes, I have a fishing trip coming up and I have heard fish can be good in your compost or turned into fertilizer. Um, would you recommend it? Um, certainly fish, uh, you know, we have fish product, fish based um, organic products in there. Um, I guess that if you do that, uh, you know, it's going to be in your compost pile. Uh, I think that's probably not a great idea because I have a feeling you are going to invite things like raccoons and skunks and other small mammals into your compost pile. So I think I would pass on that. Okay. Um, Gail asks, could you tell us how to control Japanese beetles? Well, that's a, that's a class in and of itself. So um, the, the skinny is that if you have things like um, roses and hibiscus and things that are dramatically, where they're dramatically affecting the flowers, you probably want to use a systemic drench in the soil, um, you know, two to three weeks ahead of the arrival, which is usually about the, the first week at full week in July, um, so that the systemic insecticide is in the plant system so that when they start feeding on the plant tissue, they ingest that and they die. Um, the other things are, um, if you don't have many plants, you can hand pick them, um, or you can get a large mouth container with soapy water in there, and you can put that under the plant and tap the plant. And very often when you stun them, they will drop down into that. So those are two organic ways uh, to control Japanese beetles. Just know that there is a lot of research that indicates that if the first um, emerging Japanese beetle adults are find really, really great feeding and they are not disturbed. They actually emit a hormone that lets other Japanese beetles know that it is safe to feed here. And so it's almost like ringing the dinner bell, they will all come in. So regardless of what your choice of control on Japanese beetles is, um, it's a good idea to really work on that first um, half of, ja of July, uh, getting out there and whatever control you're using, try and get rid of those first arrivers because that can mean a difference um, in the number that you have later. Um, I am, Laura asks, I am planning to plant an Adirondack crab this spring. Do I have to worry about the cicadas? Should I wait until fall? Um, there are annual cicadas. Laura, and there are periodical cicadas. And uh, I am not aware of this being a year. And believe me, I sh should be on top of that. If there is, if this is the year of emergence of a periodical, periodical cicada, and it is not. So the annual cicadas are totally uh, a non-issue. And best selection of crab apples is in the spring. Uh, let's see here, oops, I had any trouble. 
So I think I'm at the end then. Okay, uh, Lori is the last question. And this is, I have a bay plant that has scale. I've been fighting it for years. Is there some something systemic that would kill the scale? Um, yes, there is, Lori. But um, if you are harvesting the bay leaves for cooking, then obviously that is not something um, that you want to do. So, um, I would say that I am not aware of something that is that you're going to be able to use on a, on a you know an advanced mature infestation for something that's edible. And um, I thank you all for attending. I hope this has been worthwhile, and we look forward to seeing you next week uh, at the same time when I'm going to be talking about rhododendrons and azaleas and how to succeed with them. So thank you very much. <laughs>